we have gathered here today to have our second event on Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, regional and international implications. And I'd like to ask Mr. Our President, Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman, and editor of Dhaka Tribune, Mr. Zafir Subhan, to deliver the opening remarks and moderate the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ahona. And a very warm welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen. It's a distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's discussion on the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan and its implications, both at the regional scale and at the international scale. It is quite well evident that we have just crossed the 100 days mark. So it is very appropriate and very timely that we take a stock taking of what is happening there and what are its short term, mid term and long term implications. The Taliban takeover in Afghanistan not only has created a crisis, but there is a bigger disaster waiting to happen. From a security issue, Afghanistan is now turning into the world's largest disaster prone area and a humanitarian disaster in the making. With the winter setting in, there is now food shortage, shortage of medicine, shortage of energy, and a possible meltdown economically. So such a complex emergency situation is happening right at our doorsteps and we in South Asia need to understand the complexities of the problem in Afghanistan. For that reason, we've got a wonderful panel today to deliberate and discuss on this issue. We've got General Ferdos Bia, who is the former chairman of Bangladesh Institute, International Institute of Strategic Studies, or BIS, which is the MOFAS think tank. We've got Dr. Laila Foyaspin from Department of International Relations of Dhaka University, and an eminent scholar, particularly on issues of South Asian security. And we've also got Mr. Pervez Karim Abbasi from East West University, who deeply understand the geoeconomic issues related to the region. So without further ado, I will once again warmly welcome you to this afternoon's session and a few words from our co-host, Zafar Soban. Uh, thank you very much, General Munir. I'm just glad to be to get a speaking role in such an august gathering because I come to these um, roundtable discussions which we're jointly convening between Dhaka Tribune and BIPs largely to learn. I think it's a really great initiative that the two organizations are, are putting together to really engender and foster greater discussion of this uh, geostrategic sphere. As mentioned uh, by Ohana, our first um, such roundtable last month was very successful, the inaugural roundtable. And I feel that this one is, uh, you know, if anything, even more important of a subject. I think General Munir has done a good job of explaining just what the implications are and why with the uh, 100 days since the takeover has happened, now is the suitable time for us to really discuss these issues. And I would also suggest that uh, while we look at the regional and international issues, one thing which um, I... Uh, hope our discussion will also encompass today is the implications for us here in Bangladesh. And certainly, you know, there's um, the question of how does the Dal Taliban takeover um, impact South Asia, the region, but I think we should also ask ourselves some tough questions as to what are the specific implications for us here in Bangladesh. Um, with that, let me uh, pass the mic back to General Munir, and uh, soon I think we will move on to our experts and hear what they have to say. Thank you, Zafar. Uh, without saying anything now at this stage, I will turn to our expert panel for them to give their comments. I will request each one of them to speak for about eight to 10 minutes, because we are very keen to listen to you, who are the real experts. Such an August gathering must bring in sufficient discussion with the audience. Therefore, we will straight go to Major General Mohammad Fedospia. As I said, he's a former chairman of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, BISS, an organization famously known for its knowledge base, 
and I was proud to head that organization once. So generally you have the floor for next eight to ten minutes. Can I stand and speak so that I can see this? Absolutely. <clears throat> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, respected President Bibbs, uh, General Munir Zaman, uh, Editor the Dhaka Tribune, Zafar Subhan, my fellow panelists, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an honor to be stand in front of you and interact with you. As General Munir Zaman has said that it is such an August gathering that it's a knowledge that we'll learn more. When uh, General Munir Zaman, he told me that I'll be the first speaker, I said, oh, it's such a com complex subject. You talk about Afghanistan, how much we know about Afghanistan? We just know, yes, it is there. But what are the dynamics? What are the complexities of that particular place? How does it impact us? It may not be impacting us directly that we see on day-to-day -day events, but it has a very serious long-term impact and effects that is looming. Uh, as the moderator has uh, in his opening statement said that we have need to take a hundred is a stop that how it is faring after this uh, Taliban takeover. This Taliban takeover, it came as a very, very big surprise. On 15th August, they took the entire world by surprise after taking over uh, the helms of affairs in Kabul when yeah, President Rashad Ghani fled the country and from Islamic Republic to Islamic Republic of Afghanistan became Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan just overnight. But that also in pen and paper. But did it change things? Of course it changed things. After the pull out of this US-led NATO forces from Afghanistan, that left a very huge vacuum. Huge vacuum in its security, in its economic situation, in its financial management, in its social understanding and many other discourses. But there was no preparation as to how this vacuum is going to be filled and how this uh, population of our 40 million people are going to be governed. And who are these people? It is the most, one of the most complex societies in this particular globe today. This 40 million people, they comprise of 40 to 42% of Pashtuns about 19% uh, of Tajik, 7% Hazaras, 7% of uh, <clears throat> Uzbek, then Aymak, Nuristani, and so on. Arabs also. There, there are Arabs also. Thank you, sir. And they have the tribes within. So this is such a complex society that throughout the centuries, starting from Darius of Babylonia, then uh, Alexander the Great from Macedonia, Sultan Mahmud Ghazni, Genghis Khan, the British Empire, the Soviet Empire, and lastly the US, they have all tried to venture there, but they couldn't last. Why? There must be a reason behind it. And my understanding is that all these people, they fail to understand this Afghan people. They have just failed to understand their psyche, their expectations, their humility and their social understanding and religious beliefs. That's what is my understanding. So, after this uh, Taliban, they took over 20 years fighting from the mountains and the rural areas. All of a sudden, they are in Kabul in the hells of affair. Many of them has not been uh, in Kabul in his entire life and he is now dictating terms. And no one, as of today, no one knows that who is calling the shots. No one knows who is calling the shots. So we have serious humanitarian crisis in the making, migration issues, financial collapse, then drug trafficking, and then inter-party factions and fight in between those factions and they are trying to settle a score at various places because there is no government, central government that has been established as yet. And how long it will take to have that in place and as a functionary machine to govern this kind of society and this war-ravished country that is yet to be seen. 
So there are many aspects of today's discussion that uh, the other panelists was going to cover. So what I was giving was that will Afghanistan again become a sanctuary for regional terrorism? And I will discuss this thing under three headlines. Impact of violent extremism in the region and beyond, rise of uh, Islamic State Khorasan province and its implications, and internal conflict that is going to affect internally at it and its spillover. So <clears throat> let's see from the Afghan government standpoint. After 100 days, what it is facing is that illegality and acceptance issue. It is not a recognized government or ruler by any international community. All financial assistance has been stopped. And hunger, poverty, violence, winter, all these things are coming together to all these Afghan people. And that is giving rise to a society which is becoming very unstable very poor, very hungry, and very restless. And in this kind of environment, terrorism thrives. Terrorism thrives in this kind of unsettled and restive environment. So Afghanistan is a potential ground where such violent extremism may rise and also expand. So let's now try to point out who are the main actors that might have some effect in this. The first thing that comes in mind is that Islamic State of Khorasan province. Then there are Haqqani network. Then across the border is tehreek -e taliban Pakistan. Then there are Northern Alliance. And there are some other smaller groups also. But these are the main actors. The starting with that the main key actor in this area who are opposing the Taliban's now are the Islamic State Khorasan province. So this is an extension of ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Al Sham. So in 2014 and 15, when Tehrik Taliban Pakistan was having its uh, activities in the northwestern province of uh, Pakistan, so there was some serious military government action against them, and many commanders they fled the country. And there was another group from Taliban, Afghani Taliban, those who thought that Taliban are going very soft from their ideology and they are basically negotiating with the Western governments with a very limited objective of governing and ruling Afghanistan only. But ISIS has a much bigger vision. They have a global vision of establishing a caliphate based on Salafi jihadist philosophy. So that's why there was a breakaway faction. So people coming from Tehrik Taliban Pakistan, people coming from uh, Afghani Taliban, people coming from Al Qaeda, all this went group together, then the ISIS from Syria and Baghdad, the same emissaries, and Mr. Baghdadi was that time, uh, he was a leader, and he formed this group and formally announced this Islamic State of Khorasan province. They have other provinces also, Islamic State. They are the, they are the province in Sinai, they are province of the East Asia, Southwest uh, Africa. So there are various places. So this became the Khorasan province. And they are diehard enemy of the Taliban, of the Afghan, previous Afghan government, as well as Western forces. So they have been fighting all those three enemies together. They are fierce in their, because they are, are believing in certain things. And after this uh, 15th August takeover of Taliban, they have stepped up their attacks just to make their presence felt. They were very much active in uh, Nangahar province and Kunal province. That falls within the FAT area, federally administered tribal area. That falls between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And that area, you must have heard about the Durand line. Mr. Rajiv Dogra in India writer, he wrote that Durand's curse. It's a line through the heart, Pashtun, uh, Pashtun heart. This line has divided this Pashtun community into two groups. They are same community, but the British Empire, they had to draw a line starting from Xinjiang province in China in the north and reaching up to the borders of Iran in the southwest. 
but it goes through the heartland of Pashtun community. The Pashtun community, they were all of a sudden divided geographically, but psychologically, philosophically, so socially, you cannot, could not divide them. So there are Pashtuns in Afghanistan, there are Pashtuns in Pakistan. There are more numbers of Pashtuns in Pakistan than in Afghanistan. So now these Pashtuns, they have the certain thing to say. Now about 38 million Pashtuns who live in Pakistan, they have a serious effect on the Pakistani politics, its security. At the same time, how they interact with the Afghan Pashtuns. So Pakistan was in a serious problem that this Pashtun should, should rather look towards Islamabad for direction and other guidance than to Kabul. So they have their serious problem in their hand. And the Afghan Pashtun, their rise as a Mujahideen against the Soviet invasion, then later they, they took over uh, as a Taliban to fight against the US invasion. They had a very brief period of ruling from 1996 to you, 2001. You, you can take one more minute. Okay. So, the so, <clears throat> they did not have a much better and educated history of governance. So this governance issue is going to be very, very serious for them. So there are much more implications that unless this particular issue is resolved, the international community must act very quickly and urgently in providing them financial support, releasing their assets, giving humanitarian aid, and help this Taliban government to institute a farm government with other institutions like their parliament, their electoral system, their governance, and capacity building of fighting terrorism and insurgency <coughs> in the country. If that doesn't happen, it is going to be a failed state, and then anything is possible, and it is going to affect its neighbors, starting from Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, China, Pakistan, India, in the immediate region, and in Bangladesh and other countries by extension. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Fedos. You raised some very interesting questions. The first thing, first takeaway that I take from your discussion is that Afghanistan has never been a centrally controlled government in Kabul. And that seems to continue. But the bigger difficulty that we see now is the internal feud between the factions of Taliban. There is the so-called Doha Taliban who are negotiating with the international community. There is those Taliban that are controlling their operations on the ground. There is also the Haqqani group that controls Kabul. So we have all sorts of elements of fractions within the Taliban set up itself. The other question that comes to our mind is which of the better devil we should support? Should we support the Taliban or the ice Krasham? Can the international community afford Afghanistan to fail? What are the implications of a failed Afghanistan? Will it remain the same security? or it will pose a bigger security threat to the international community and to the region. So these are the questions I want to lay before you so that you can bring them back to us during the discussion period. Our next speaker on the panel is Dr. Lailufar Yasmin, Professor of International Relations at the Dhaka University. And Lailufar, you have the floor. Um, thank you, uh, BIPSS and uh, Dhaka Tribune for organizing this, uh, this 100 day of stock taking about what is happening in, in Afghanistan. Um, in fact, it is, it is very laudable because uh, often we tend to forget what has happened and we move on to a new issue. And uh, that has been also the feature of current international order where we are uh, once talk, talking about uh, Rohingya issue, then Afghanistan issue, then jumping to South China Sea or in the Pacific. So we, we really do not have any we, we lack focus for which uh, many of the issues ha have become more complex than ever. Um, and I thank my previous speaker for uh, pointing out that Afghanistan is a country which cannot be understood without being there uh, from the outside. Here in this part of South Asia, um, uh, we uh, actually take pride uh, in saying that uh, a number of travelers have gone to Afghanistan, they have written about Afghanistan. So we have fairly a different idea about how it is portrayed in Western media. And that is 
entirely different and some of those are uh, recently being um, uh, reported and being written in the Atlantic and some other uh, areas, especially with regard to women's issues. Uh, because uh, uh, when we talk about women's issues, we think uh, certain kind of attire makes uh, women, um, um, you know, is imposed by the Taliban, but that has been um, uh, Afghanistan's cultures for over the centuries, in fact. So th there are some, uh, a number of misunderstood issues. Those are not really taken into consideration and those are uh, thought to be, you know, imposed by Taliban, but that is how culture uh, and, um, you know, religion um, was there. Um, so uh, anyway, my issue, my topic today, in fact, uh, a little bit different. I'm going to talk about, uh, just because I'm a woman, I'm not going to talk about women's issues. So I'm going to talk about the role of regional powers, China and its position, humanitarian disaster, and uh, the issue of migration and as far as I can uh, uh, limit within uh, only eight minutes of time. Um, so um, Afghanistan, as we all know, has uh, six uh, direct neighbors um, and it affects, as my previous speaker said, that its stability and the rise of uh, extremism or sponsoring of uh, extremism actually uh, affects its uh, you know, uh, extended neighbors such as Bangladesh or other uh, countries. So here, what we have seen, a number of countries uh, who are uh, who belong to um, in Afghanistan's immediate region or a little far away region or even uh, further away, they are concerned about the stability and creation of an inclusive government in Afghanistan. Now, how do we define inclusive government in Afghanistan? They argue that it should include uh, representatives from different ethnic and religious groups, and that's how only Afghanistan uh, Afghanistan stability can be provided, and it can be accepted by all the factions there. As my previous speaker also said, and uh, um, uh, Major Zaman said, that um, uh, Afghanistan has never been, uh, uh, no uh, ruler has been able to centrally control Afghanistan. There has been various reasons for that, because rural urban disconnect, this has been a, a huge issue because of the terrain, because of the you know lower rate of education, a number of issues that has prevented uh, from uh, 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 anyone to control Afghanistan fully. Uh, but then, when we are talking about inclusive uh, government, is it going to be on the basis of a democratic uh, uh, norm, or is it going to be uh, uh, in a different kind of representation? That, you know, is still to be uh, uh, seen. So, one of the first meetings of foreign ministers uh, of uh, China, Iran, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Af uh, Uzbekistan took place in early September. This was first meeting uh, that took place to decide on, you know, how, uh, how to ensure Afghanistan's uh, stability. Uh, but interestingly, um, it is the external actors and their ideas are being channeled there. Uh, then uh, very rightly pointed out, we actually do not know who is controlling, who is the central command of Afghanistan. That is a major you know, issue behind uh, any UN recognition or any other country's recognition because so far three countries, uh, Pakistan, United uh, Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia has provided formal recognition to Afghanistan, but other countries are willing to work with the Taliban-led government but they have not provided any uh, formal recognition. Then the second meeting uh, took place in October 27, uh, where Iran, China, uh, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Russia uh, joined. And they again called for um, you know, uh, open, um, you know, establishing an inclusive and representative government. Uh, now, interestingly, November 10, there was a Delhi declaration. Now, because of uh, India, Pakistan's uh, diplomatic spat, in, in two of the meetings, India did not participate. And in the November 10 Delhi Declaration, Pakistan did not participate. Although, you know, when India is uh, uh, planning to send wheat and some other, uh, uh, you know, um, 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 sort of uh, crops and other assistances to um, Afghanistan, Pakistan has agreed to provide a uh, sort of a route to provide all those um, uh, humanitarian goods. Uh, so, Delhi Declaration also called for because India's, uh, you know, extended West. Uh, West um, uh, Asia policy, Afghanistan is one of the key uh, region. Not only that, Iran, India's access to Iran also depends on its uh, you know, relationship with Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, a number of diplomatic activities we have seen happening in terms of regional powers and extra-regional powers uh, trying, to, uh, trying to argue, trying to sit together, trying to settle and talk with the Taliban-led government um, about how to establish some kind of some semblance of uh, you know, norm normalcy in 
in in uh, 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 within Afghanistan. Um, in terms of Chinese role, we know that how China has been trying to sort of uh, mobilize its internal crowd as well as external uh, crowd so that Taliban led gov led government uh, receives international recognition. So uh, China ORF uh, Observer Research Foundation uh, very interestingly pointed out that China's policy can be uh, uh, articulated as being from calculated indifference to strategic engagement gradually with Afghanistan. So this was a very interesting way of you know, pointing out what role China is playing. China interestingly shares 57 miles long border with Afghanistan, uh, but it has a greater stake in terms of its uh, rise, not only economic rise, but also its role, possible role in uh, coming international order. If you have seen in the recent International Affairs article, there was this argument that in international law, uh, order, we can see the rise of two competitive uh, uh, sort of orders. One is America-led uh, uh, capitalist and democratic uh, sort of uh, alliance. Another is authoritative, uh, China-led authoritative and, um, you know, um, uh, capitali as well as capitalist uh, international order. So uh, therefore, China wants to uh, play a more assertive role in international order to establish its version of capitalism, its version of, you know, how it sees uh, uh, the capitalist system. Primarily, China is led by two particular uh, uh, reasons uh, for its engagement in um, Afghanistan. Uh, there, there are various other reasons, but I'm just emphasizing on two uh, particular issues. Number one, Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang province who have ethnic and historic ties with Pakistan and Afghanistan and other, you know, Muslim uh, dominated um, sort of countries. Uh, and then number two, threat from Islamist uh, terrorist, uh, terror groups that may emerge um, um, to China and to uh, CPEC. China Pakistan economic corridor. Um, also, China is um, uh, China has established uh, its listening post in Tajikistan and also strengthening uh, uh, security relations with a number of you know Afghanistan's you know Central Asian countries who are also who also border with Afghanistan. Uh, in terms of humanitarian issues, um, WP says 95 percent of Afghans will be suffering from food insecurity in the coming year. 97 percent are expected to live below uh, poverty line in the next year. Uh, so. So a number of countries, they're trying to engage um, um, uh, with Afghanistan via uh, different international organizations such as UNDP, WFP. Um, for example, uh, South Korea recently has pledged $32 million uh, via different international agencies to uh, to provide for humanitarian relief. A number of other countries, for example, United States of America and other countries are also coming up with such pledges, um, although even uh, United States is not uh, has declared that it will not release Afghan government's asset to the Taliban-led government, obviously because it has not recognized this Taliban-led government. Um, so more or less, uh, these are the issues that we need to look into how regional politics is being played, uh, what are the stakes for India, what are the stakes for Pakistan, Iran in this context, and how Russia, you see, uh, 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 Russia, uh, no matter what is the uh, state of Russia-China uh, bilateral relations on some of the global issues, they align their policies, keeping in mind of long-term strategic implications of that. Afghanistan is has provided one such area for China and Russia to come closer. Uh, so we need to be mindful of this, you know, short-term interest, long-term interest, and uh, this is how international order is playing now, that issue-based uh, you know, alliances, as we have seen in the case of AUKUS, uh, we have seen in the case of Quad, and many other such, uh, you know, alliances. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you, Laila, for as expected, you raised some very interesting questions again. As Afghanistan starts to fail, there is a flurry of regional actors who are starting to play an important role and fill up the vacuum. We first saw the role of the Conference of Intel Chiefs in Islamabad, called by ISI. We saw the foreign ministers of the region meeting in Tehran under Iranian invitation. We saw the conference of NSAs in India, in Delhi, not attended by Pakistan and China both. Only yesterday, we saw another conference in Turkmenistan trying to drum up financial support and aid to Afghanistan. So we see a number of regional actors coming into play. And it is difficult to pinpoint exactly in which direction it is going. But as is Student of current issues, my only honest request will be to the international community to engage 
Afghanistan itself directly. Doha should not become the alternate capital of Afghanistan. Afghan people have a capital. They have the people, they have their leadership. It calls for direct engagement with Afghan people, whatever means it is possible. It's such a pity that a country that sits on $3 trillion of known mineral reserve is going into a state of starvation. And we as members of international community must take stock of everything and analyze exactly how we are living them. And these are the pertinent questions and issues which will be directly addressed by our next speaker, Pravesh Karim Babasi, a known scholar of geoeconomics from East West University. Pravesh, you have the floor. Yes, uh, I think you have set the floor very nicely. Because of paucity of time, I'll just go for the jugular. Uh, the first thing that over here is that I'll give you an outline of what the presentation will be within 10 minutes. First of all, I'll give you a very compressed snapshot, which has already been covered by uh, Professor Laila Yufar Yasmin, about the economic condition of Afghanistan. Number two, I'll be focusing on the geospatial and geoeconomic uh, politics surrounding Afghanistan, especially with this, as General Munir had rightly mentioned, $3 trillion worth of mineral reserves. And what are the interests of the neighboring countries around this? Number three, I'll be hopefully talking about China's role in a, in a more specific manner. And if time permits, I will also try to talk about what are the repercussions for, repercussions for Bangladesh, directly and indirectly. So wish me luck. Now, one thing we forget that when America actually stormed into Afghanistan, uh, it's econ and I'm focusing on the economic indicators. Uh, the income was around $900 per capita, but by 2020, it had risen to $2,100. But it's another thing that at least 40% of the economy was directly funded by aid. So it is a rentier economy in the classical sense, always driven by corruption, driven by aid, and driven by money displacement. So America spent a lot of money, but with all due respect, the money was not smartly spent. So good governance is the advice that they give us and we should follow, but they should also follow it themselves, number one. Number two is what has happened after America has gone away. Those who are jumping in joy because of Taliban has taken over, well, sobering lesson economic wise, skyrocketing inflation, cash almost out, foreign currencies confiscated, bank runs, massive capital flight, massive brain drain. They don't have people to even run the central bank. They don't have medicine, uh, essential medical supplies gone. Along with this, what has exacerbated the problem is uh, the US uh, confiscating or freezing $9.5 billion worth of Afghanistan's foreign exchange reserves. The IMF suspending in two tranches nearly $500 million worth of assistance. And into this breach, because nature abhors a vacuum, China has stepped in promising $31 million of emergency aid. The US and EU has also, as Professor Yasmin has pointed out, has committed to disburse aid. But as we know from the Rohingya issue, that again, commitment and actual implementation is way off. That is again, the economic aspect of this. In terms of poverty level, before COVID, the poverty rates, people living below the poverty line was 72%. UNDP has come up with a sobering estimate. By next year, 97% of the entire population of 38 million people would be living below the poverty line. That's the economic snapshot. People, countries will pursue their own cynical motives, but that is unfortunate. Tell it to the poor ordinary Afghan who's caught in the middle. He won't understand or she won't understand. That's the first part. And of course, there's 2.6 million refugees in three of the countries, Pakistan, Iran, and Tajikistan and nearly 400 million internally displaced people. With this kind of volatile situation, it's almost ridiculous to talk about the $3 trillion worth of reserves. We always talk about the $3 trillion worth of reserves, but what is it actually about? And now I'm going to give you a small breakdown. I won't bore you with all the details, but what is basically, what do we mean by the $3 trillion worth of reserves? And again, the US Geological Survey came up. Soviet Union actually came up with a lot of uh, survey in the early 70s. And also it was later on reconfirmed with the Afghanistan uh, Minerals and Petroleum Ministry. Now, four or five facts. 
Number one, Afghanistan by conservative estimates contains 2.2 billion tons of iron ore. It has the top 10 iron reserves, proven iron reserves in the world. Where can you find this? You will find this basically in the Hajigak mine in the Bamiyan province. And that's where you see the and this is a common thing. Wherever there are natural resources, the fight is most in those provinces. Number two, you have 183 million tons of aluminium. Iron and aluminium are the most extensively used metals in the world for industrial production. Again, where do you find this? Badakhshan and Kandahar. No wonder the Taliban was fighting tooth and nail to get control of those provinces. 2,700 kgs of worth of gold deposits enough to satisfy India's gold craving forever. Again, where do you find this? Again, one name is coming up over and over again. Again, in Badakhshan and Zabul, which is a small province over there. Now, along with this, 1.3 billion tons of marble, the pink onyx type of marble. Where do you find this? Nangahar, which is also the hotbed for uh, ISIS or, or uh, ISIS Khorasan's uh, operations. And this pink marble oryx has a massive demand in India and Pakistan for construction reasons. Along with this, 500 million tons of limestone, all of them essential construction material. And emerging economies like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, all require this. Now, these are the ones that we are already known about. What about copper? We have nearly around 516 million tons of co copper. Mesainak, the co in Logar province, that alone has a massive amount of copper reserves. And copper is used for every kind of uh, modern day industrial activity. Now let's go to the rare earth minerals, which is now uh, one thing that we really love to talk about. And with the green energy transition, uh, rare earth metals like lithium, if you talk about uh, uranium, cerium, presidinium, neodymium, I'm not a student of chemistry, but I know how they work. These are found in substantial quantities in Afghanistan. And because you have this lithium supply chain disruption, China and America for fighting for supply chain control of lithium, or for cerium, for monobdenium, all of those things, what are they used for? Lithium is used for batteries. Monobdenium, what is it used for? Uh, neodymium, what is it used for? Magnetic uh, magnets. And this is used for basically hybrid cars. So for any kind of in, uh, green energy transition, resource strapped, energy strapped, minerals energy strapped, uh, the Asia will require Afghanistan. So there is a very cynical economic motive behind this. Unfortunately, that's on paper. So why hasn't it translated into prosperity? One thing is easy because it's rocket science. Number one, internecine fighting. The mess INAC copper reserves were leased out for at least 28 to 20, uh, for 28 to 29 billion dollars to the MCC, not the cricket club over here, but this is again the, this is again a consortium from China. Unfortunately, it has been leased back for 13 years earlier. Till now, they could not extract anything. What makes it worse is a mountainous region, three mountainous systems: Hindu Kush, Pamir, Karakoram. So you need railways, you need power, and you need connectivity. It's not going to happen. And also you have warlords who are siphoning off uh, rare earth metals for their own uses. Taliban, one of the reasons why they were quite successful, where they were able to control at least 280 out of the 720 mining zones in Afghanistan, even before the fall of Kabul, and they could finance themselves. They earned around $460 million from mineral extraction, not my words, UN report. That's the second part of the report. Now, that is a geospatial region. What about the regional energy connectivity? That's if you especially focus about TAPI, TAP, and the CASA 1000. I'll be very brief because I know there's a paucity of time over here. Now, the first one is we always talk about TAPI. What is that? Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. Whether we'll have India at the end of the day is another question. It remains to be seen. Now, it comes off from the Galkinish gas uh, reserve, uh, gas mines or gas fields in Turkmenistan, the second largest gas reservoir goes all the way from to Herat, Kandahar, then goes into uh, this go, then goes into Peshawar, Quetta, and then finally ends up into basically Fazilka in Indian Punjab, 1800 kilometers, 33, million, uh, 33 billion cubic uh, feet of 
gas will be delivered over there. Afghanistan is expected to earn $500 million in transit fees. And they'll take 5% of the gas uh, that will be supplied, and the rest will be divided between India and Pakistan. That was the initial plan. And operations started in 2016 in Turkmenistan, work started in 2018 in Afghanistan, and it's just started to deliver right now. But with, Afghan the, with the change in power, the Taliban have basically indicated over and over that they are going to honor the TAPI project. But will it actually take place? We have the Turkmenistan's foreign minister coming in. And he was actually meeting with all the Afghan, uh, uh, what to say, the elite. And they had promised that they were going to honor the TAPI project. That's one. So Pakistan, India, and again, Turkmenistan have all vested interest for that to work. And just one more project, and then I'll be then trying to finish it off. Uh, along with this, you also have the TAP project. What is TAP? This is a Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan project, which is an electricity transit. So what is that? There's a 500 kilovolt line, which is known as a TAP 500, stretching over seven kilometers, all the way from Turkmenistan to Afghanistan to Pakistan, because Pakistan's energy necessity is, or energy requirement is as high as India's actually. And again, this also it was supposed to be built by 2022. Now, the TAPI project costs $10 billion. The TAP project costs $2 billion. Apart from this, you have the Lapis Lazuli uh, trade uh, transit, the trade and transit corridor. And that is what was supposed to be funded by ADB. And that was going to give Afghanistan a uh, connection from all the way into Azerbaijan, into, across the Black Sea, into Turkey. What will happen to this? Will ADB continue funding this? See, these are some of the things that, again, I've, because right now there is no political stability in Afghanistan, so we cannot actually say for certain. And into this void comes into China. China was already a presence in Afghanistan even during Afghan, or even during uh, the, uh, the, even during the, before the fall of Kabul. And this is what a serious strategic oversight of the West, because the Chinese had invested around four, over $400 billion dollars. $400 million. What was the U.S. investment? Only $18 million. So you can already see that there was a huge, the Chinese had a huge strategic footprint. And rightly, it has been pointed out by both the speakers that China's main interest is to basically stabilize Xinjiang, root out the East Turkestan Islamic movement, which has suddenly been delisted by the U.S. as a terrorist organization. So interesting days ahead. And Last but not the least, it also wants to extend the $62 billion CPEC project into Afghanistan. But fools rush in where angels fear to tread. China also knows that there is a possibility that it can be bled dry in Afghanistan. So you will see humanitarian assistance, but they are going to require either the Pakistani security establishment or their, or let's say their groups which are allied with them who are going to deliver them security umbrella before they invest. Because they have learned from the experience, or we hope they have learned from the experience of the Soviet Union and the Americans, that investing in China, just because you have geostrategic resources or reserves, the Afghans, as both the speakers have said, have a mind of their own. And history has managed to prove us that Afghanistan has always surprised the world and even themselves. But at what cost to the to themselves and to the entire region remains to be seen. So I think I'm, my time is up. One minute. One minute. In terms of Bangladesh, as promised, because I always try to deliver on my promise. I, only my wife doesn't agree on this. <laughs> uh, jokes aside. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what has happened with Bangladesh? Three things. We fare. We one of the Afghanistan is not that far away. Narco terrorism. The production of opium is now 6,300 tons in 2020. So opium can come in. Well, we we'll say that synthetic chemicals are in, but again, opium will come in because people are going to buy cheaper drugs. Number two, the huge cache of weapons that has been left behind, small weapons, small arms, terrorist groups can take in from all over the world. And number three, fringe groups, and I'm saying this with extreme responsibility, fringe groups, who use religion to upset the balance. 
whether it's in India, whether it's Bangladesh, so whether you have Hindutva will have an excuse, or whether you'll have fringe groups in Pakistan or Bangladesh who would want to upset the existing order, that can also take place. And when you have this disbanded Afghan National Army, on paper 300,000, at least in real life 150,000, most of them are not there. Who is to say that they will not work as mercenaries? or will not make their way in, uh, in religious uh, festivals or get together. It's very difficult to see, differentiate between South Asians. We almost all look the same, no matter what we say. So again, these are some of the things that we really need to watch out for. And the rise of religious chauvinism, the rise of revanchism, that we need to watch out for. And the rise of the, or the victory of the Taliban, incomplete victory of the Taliban might send the wrong message to many people who want to misconstrue the message in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Pervez, for delivering on time and very pertinent points of the kind of the mineral rush that we are now seeing in Afghanistan, big powers rushing into cash on Afghanistan mineral resources. Afghanistan is also a source of export of three other unwanted commodities. One is the instability in Afghanistan can reach other countries. Second is VE or violent extremism will reach other countries, not only in the region, but externally. And the third is drugs. International drug scene is going to experience a tremendous spike in the coming year because of increased poppy production in the country. So therefore, whatever happens in Afghanistan internally has a direct implications not only to the region, but to the international community and the world. We have talked about the failure of the last 20 years in Afghanistan, about the international occupation of the US occupation of Afghanistan. But what we have overlooked is the internal successes that was inbuilt into the system of the 20 years of occupation. In the last 20 years, we also saw a rise of a vibrant Afghan civil society. We saw revival of women's education, empowerment of women. We saw a fair degree of free press and a vibrant press, both print and electronic media. We saw Afghanistan's culture coming back into the fore. Those are the strengths of Afghanistan that must be caught and consolidated. We cannot let it waste. If we want Afghanistan to survive and succeed, then these are the elements that must be taken into a consideration and they should be strengthened before they're completely lost. We also need to see the very positive role that can be played by his neighbors, particularly Pakistan, Iran, Central Asian countries, also to some extent India, and certainly an emerging role of China. Afghanistan should not become the battleground for big powers to play. The battle should be for Afghan people, and that is our hope. With that, we will now open the floor for your comments, questions, and a discussion point. Dr. Tubun, has very nicely agreed and will bring out a supplement with all the proceedings and it will be reported in the press. So please ask your questions and com give your comments. Raise your hand or just indicate to me that you would like to ask a question. I'll give you the floor and please introduce yourself briefly when you get the floor. Can I see the show of hands? We will start first with the ambassador of the Palestine. Sorry, you have the floor. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good evening to all of you. It's really an honor for me to be among these dignitaries and uh, those people who are really professional in their work. I really highly appreciate what the three speakers said. And my question is, to you, sir, do you think we as Asian or as 
the regional countries around Afghanistan or the OIC countries specifically should help the Taliban, encourage the Taliban to be more and more modernate, encourage or advise Taliban how they should run their country, give them assistance, financial assistance, medical assistance, all kind of assistance, or should we abandon them? And what if we do the first, what will happen? Or what do you expect if we stick to the last one, which to abandon them? Because <clears throat> as you just mentioned, in the history of Afghanistan, no one was able to rule this country. No one. Because Afghanistan, the Afghan people, or the, the, the culture of the Afghan people, they reject someone to dictate them. They don't accept that. As Dr. Yasmin saying, that we also misunderstood one thing. It is in the culture of Afghanistan treating women the way Taliban is treating them. It is not Taliban. It is the culture of Afghanistan. It is only during the American, when they were in Afghanistan, they wanted to present the model of the West and inject it into the Afghan culture, which is, will be rejected, as you know. <clears throat> so what I meant is, we as OIC, should we help them? Encourage them or abandon them? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Ambassador Shamim. Please, you could pass the microphone. Thank you, General Munir, for inviting me and really happy being here. I'll be very short. I'll make uh, one or two observations. I don't have any question to ask. Uh, I feel that for Afghanistan, what is of immediate concern, this should be a matter of very serious and immediate concern for international communities impending humanitarian disaster, which really looming large overhead, and how this disaster expanded the snowballs and how the government uh, in Kabul, which is currently is, is the Taliban uh, dispensation, will uh, determine uh, the, the course of action in Afghanistan, the further developments, and the international community should take upon itself it as a responsibility to help Afghanistan and the government in Kabul to tide over the situation arising from the humanitarian disaster, which will be further accentuated as the winter sets in. And I hope that the American government will have a particular role because they facilitated the Doha Agreement. And one observation, one expression that Taliban surprised Taliban takeover of uh, Kabul. I don't see any element of surprise there because as, as soon as the Doha Accord was signed, I mean, one could sort of uh, foresee what's going to happen. I mean, Taliban's takeover of Kabul, the, the, the period led up to the Taliban takeover, everything happened as per the Doha playbook. So there was no surprise element there. And uh, I'll pick up one point made by Professor Larufa about three countries having recognized uh, Afghanistan well, well, I don't know which those three countries are, but I particularly remember you mentioned Pakistan, but I'm not sure if Pakistan has been well recognized Afghanistan, the government. I mean, it's not the question of recognizing the country. I mean, I don't think the government in Kabul has been recognized by Pakistan yet, although the Afghan foreign minister was in Kabul recently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Brigadier Azaz. Thank you, sir. Brigadier General Izzaz, I was the former defense advisor in Pakistan and Iran. The border country is very closely related to Afghanistan issue. Uh, thanks to General Munir sir and the Dhaka Tribune and the distinguished panel for an excellent talk. My small statement and followed by a question, the Taliban before takeover and after takeover, is there any significant change? To my understanding, a chaotic situation is still prevailing. The American pullout and disaster thereafter in the airport and the American intelligence saying that it's a, their failure to assess the situation. Uh, in that case, what can be the next expectation informing the government? I personally feel that till now, 
what we have followed the government, the interim government is doing. Their stubborn attitude and the aggressive attitude towards the women and even towards the cricket team. The T20 cricket team playing in the World Cup, whether they are sponsored by the country or sponsored by individual, that is not yet clear. So stability in Pakistan, uh, sorry, the Afghanistan is really a big question to all of us. I personally feel that it's not the big power coming from the thousands of miles away, but it's the immediate neighbors like Pakistan, Iran, and India, and uh, China has to play a big role to stabilize this country. Uh, and so about Bangladesh, our the, uh, the internal situation is absolutely okay, but we should not be complacent because the Taliban have their followers and the sympathizers, and we should be careful about their activities. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Azaz. All right, sir, you have the floor. Please introduce yourself. So I would like to uh, thank the organizers for organizing this very interesting conversation and uh, for the insightful views which have been presented. Uh, this is Jahan Zab Khan. I'm the counselor from the Pakistan High Commission in Dhaka. Uh, I've, I would like to uh, present uh, some comments which would basically be outlining Pakistan's perspective and Pakistan's position on the situation and how Pakistan views the evolving uh, developments and situation. Uh, so uh, at the very outset, I would like to mention that uh, Pakistan has long-standing, deep-rooted, historical, cultural, rela uh, religious, uh, ethnic ties with Afghanistan. And apart from Afghanistan, the only country which has suffered immensely, uh, uh, apart from Afghanistan, that would be uh, Pakistan. Pakistan has suffered uh, an economic loss uh, amounting to over uh, $150 billion. Uh, Pakistan's security forces have rendered tremendous sacrifices. Uh, Pakistan security forces have uh, lost more than 80,000 personnel in the, in the fight against uh, terrorism. And uh, I mean, the social impact and the economic impact of all this uh, campaign, uh, that, is, uh, that is, I think, beyond uh, discussion right now. So Pakistan has a legitimate stake in uh, promoting uh, stable and peaceful Afghanistan. And uh, I think in, in that respect, I would like to offer uh, our, our perspective uh, to, to this August audience. Uh, so needless to say, Afghanistan has gone through a fundamental transformation. Uh, it is not very often that we see uh, in, in a single generation two superpower interventions in a region which did not uh, achieve their objectives. So I think we are going through a very, very significant moment in history. So post-August 15th, it, it represents a pivotal moment in Afghanistan's history and the international community, like uh, the speakers have mentioned, uh, they should clearly rec recognize both the challenges and the opportunities which, which we face. Uh, this is the first time in over four decades that Afghanistan is not in a state of active conflict. So there is finally an opportunity to end a decades-old conflict in Afghanistan, to root out terrorism from Afghan soil, and to enable the Afghan people to rebuild their country, which could usher in uh, Peace, uh, a period of peace, prosperity for the whole region and beyond. So this is the, the starting point from which Pakistan is proceeding. So it is critical that the international community does not repeat past mistakes and does not abandon Afghanistan at this critical juncture. Uh, recently, at a meeting of the United Nations Security Council, uh, the UN Secretary General's Special Representative for Afghanistan has warned that to abandon Afghan people now would be a historic mistake, and I think we we fully acknowledge the, the gravity of the situation. So the regional countries and the international community must therefore engage with Afghanistan for, uh, for three main uh, objectives, consolidation of peace and stability, promoting economic stability, and decreasing the space for terrorist groups inside Afghanistan. A peaceful and stable Afghanistan will be a win-win situation for the country and all regional states. It will lead to an integrated and connected region which can serve as a bridge connecting Central Asia and the Arabian Sea, thus offering immense economic opportunities. Additionally, there are a number of connectivity projects which I think have been uh, rightly mentioned by our colleague, uh, Mr. Parvez Abbasi, uh, which are in the pipeline. I would like, just like to mention CASA 1000, the TAPI, which has already been mentioned. Uh, and uh, I would like to add the Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan railway project, which is in the pipeline. Uh, additionally, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor can also be extended to include Afghanistan. 
Now let me come on the challenges. Uh, so, the so if you please keep it short, so okay. we can go down. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll just wrap it up. The immediate challenge is the dire humanitarian and economic crisis in Afghanistan, which has been raised by almost all the panelists here. According to the UN, the country's GDP has contracted by about 40%. Uh, almost half the population faces a crisis emergency situation of uh, rising food in insecurity. I will not go into details. Uh, the UN agencies, uh, the UN and its organizations are, are doing a tremendous job. And uh, according to the reports we have received, they have, they have been commending the cooperation which has been extended by the interim government in Kabul. So it is critical that uh, at this juncture that the international community provides humanitarian assistance, including through release of frozen funds. Uh, and I would like to point out that the UN Secretary General has also recently mentioned that the humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan must uh, be unconditional. Uh, just a few words on uh, Pakistan's approach towards promoting peace and stability and economic development. Pakistan initiated the platform of the six neighboring countries plus Russia which has met twice, as has been informed, and the next meeting would be held in China early next year. The aim is to promote a regional consensus on steps to normalize the situation in Afghanistan, especially through economic integration and connectivity. Secondly, the extended troika comprising China, Pakistan, Russia, and the US is a key format to promote uh, decisions requiring, requiring stabilization of Afghanistan in the region. Uh, the extended troika recently met on 11th November in Islamabad and interacted with the acting Afghan foreign minister who was visiting Pakistan. Uh, so the process of engagement, as we see, has, uh, with the government in Kabul has led to progress towards the objectives and expectations of the international community. We believe they should be continued and intensified. And I thank you very much once again. Thank you. Our next question, sir, you in the corner, you have the floor. So my name is Faisal and I'm the country representative of the Asia Foundation in Bangladesh. Uh, since I come from primarily a development uh, sector background, so my statement or questions are pretty much related to uh, my expertise. Um, uh, Dr. Nilufar mentioned about people-to-people uh, -people, uh, connection and lived experience and work experience that has been seen differently by different uh, people in, in Afghanistan. And I would like to highlight the point of uh, a Bangladeshi organization like BRAC working in, for example, in Afghanistan and how their lived and work experience is can be described as very different uh, from, uh, from a Western organization working in Afghanistan. And with that, my question or statement is that whether we are um, under uh, ambitious about Bangladesh's role uh, in Afghanistan as a regional player or not, whether we can be more ambitious about a soft player who can we can broker. And then this people-to-people -people connection that we have created over the years in Afghanistan, whether that can be uh, used as a kind of uh, soft power to uh, work in Afghanistan along with other regional powers. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have the next question from Aisha Kabir or Prothamalo. I just wanted to uh, address this question to Professor Lailofar. You were mentioning that about women in Afghanistan and that that's the way they're used to living down the ages and all. But actually, if we see during the Soviet rule or even when uh, the U.S. was in Afghanistan, the women weren't that suppressed or repressed in the sense that we have vib we had very vibrant uh, journalists there, parliamentarians there, women, girls were going to school. And they were, uh, may not be like the Western world developed or even like us, but much more than they are now. And now with this Taliban takeover, I can't help but being cynical about the position of women there because we've seen films of what's happening there. Girls are stopped being going to school many of the journalists, women who I know, have had to flee from Pakistan, including some parliamentarians. So I think uh, perhaps we shouldn't be so complacent about the women's situation there. And uh, General Firdaus, you were mentioning about, you know, giving uh, full support and assistance and help to the Taliban government, which I understand, which is needed for the people of uh, Afghanistan. And here I want to say that normally we are very critical about the Western world when they give assistance, you know, they always attach conditions, conditionalities. Perhaps since they have that tendency, could they also 
latch on some conditions, human rights conditions, women's rights conditions, education conditions, to their assistance for Afghanistan. Thank you, Asha. Uh, next question, sorry, you have the floor here. Thank you very much, General. Uh, my name is Forrest Cookson. I'm an American, but I want to be clear that I have absolutely no connection with the American government, nor do I feel very, <laughs> very pleased with its behavior. On the other hand, I think that one ought to be a little bit realistic about what is happening. The, uh, why is so much difficulty come to Afghanistan? Uh, it's clear that the Afghans, first of all, wish to and will not cooperate amongst themselves. There is a long, long history of this, and uh, it goes back a very long time. The, I think there is absolutely no realistic possibility of the United States giving any money to anything to do with Afghanistan. In fact, if I were <clears throat> advising the American government, I would say continue the war. You can see that the people who are the government are always losing. So uh, now it's much easier. The, the idea that all of this should be peaceful and so forth does not meet the interests, the national interests of the United States, nor may, may I say NATO or the <clears throat> Western oriented countries in Asia. The, uh, and I have one last comment on the minerals. Uh, many years ago, I worked on a study on mineral resource development in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. And the conclusion of this study was that there were vast mineral resources, but the costs of extracting them were so high that it was impossible to, for the foreseeable future, to ever see anything positive coming out of this. And it, you should ask yourself, the United States basically ran Afghanistan for 20 years, but there was zero uh, mineral development. Uh, nothing was done. Why was nothing done? Because all economic analysis shows that uh, the costs, the transportation costs of exploiting these minerals are not yet ready. Uh, so I do not think we can expect Afghanistan to build on, uh, uh, on the mineral resources. Afghanistan's economy is very simple. It produces drugs and it lives on foreign aid, and it has a pretty good agricultural system. And I think that's what will continue. The amount of foreign aid probably will become much less now. Uh, but the other two driving forces, the ability of the Afghans to, <clears throat> to do well in agriculture, and the ability of the Afghans to uh, produce heroin, that's what we will see in the future. Thank you. OK, sir, you have the floor. Mr. Kabir. I just uh, would like to ask uh, the panel, uh, uh, aren't we overestimating the threat of Afghanistan for Bangladesh? Because the troubles here in Afghanistan are nothing new. Uh, they, they have been having this for uh, decades. And uh, I am proud to say that we have not been affected uh, uh, so badly uh, by, the, uh, by what has happened in Afghanistan, first one. And second one, I would like to ask the panel, what do they think about the future ventures of US-led West, like the one in Afghanistan? Do, we, uh, do they need to think thrice, not twice, before engaging uh, in this type of ventures? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ryan. Thank you very much. My name is Ryan Hussain. I'm a lecturer at Global Studies and Governance Program at Indian University, Bangladesh, and probably uh, trained under General Manager on previously at BIPS. So my question is about uh, when we're talking about international involvement or in a regional involvement at Afghanistan, the question arises in what capacities? Because previously we have seen the West doing security sector reformation work, and the security sector has fallen within a month. And then the foreign aid that that lies a question of accountability. So just my question is about in what capacities will be the involvement will be. Thank you. 
All right, Shubham, you can have the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'm Shubham, and uh, I'm an intern of the organization, and I'm uh, currently a fourth year at the University of California, Riverside. So uh, I just wanted to prove a point uh, that we actually should have alarm bells ringing, especially for Bangladesh. And the point I want to try to make is through kind of a youth perspective. So I'll be very brief. So when the first um, recarnation of the Taliban happened, you saw the mobilization and the origins of found extremism in Bangladesh happened. You had all these youths flock to Afghanistan from the anti-Soviet movement. And in this takeover as well, you've seen that happen very prominently. If you look at the social media landscape, which I'm sure all of you have been following, you've had Taliban sympathetic views come all over the place. So there has to be a lot of concern regarding this, especially for Bangladesh, because understand that a lot of the militant groups that are operating right now, just like the youth have come up as leaders of the world right now in terms of climate change, a majority of the leaders in many of the militant outsources in Bangladesh are young. A lot of the people that have crossed over to Afghanistan, a very prominent member from the UGMB, he was only 22 years old. So the previous rhetoric that a militant had to have battle experience or real life war experience is no longer the case. Someone who can navigate social media, which by the way is the main source of sustenance for militant groups in the country, can become a prominent leader and can have various devastating effects for the youth. Uh, now think about it, you've seen all the events that have been happening all across the country right now. So the youth in Bangladesh are willing to mobilize for a certain cause. If militant and violent extremist outfits tap or infiltrate into this space, it could be catastrophic for um, transnational movement of young terrorists across the region. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ambassador, uh, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, my name is Shahid, uh, I'm the former ambassador, and I'm also involved with uh, a business organization. Having said that, uh, well, um, the, the three panelists, I think they made excellent uh, demarche on a uh, you know, vast subject in a very short period of time. But I think uh, uh, the question, uh, today's subject was related to our region. Uh, what are its implications? I think uh, uh, Afghanistan plays a very, prominent important role in our region because all the regional countries are directly or indirectly connected as I think it has come as a reference point uh, by many speakers, uh, whether the BRAC is involved or whether uh, uh, our people have been connected with them through ages, through centuries, even, uh, you know, if you go into Rabindranath's uh, famous uh, Wala, you will find the story of, again, the Afghanis who was sort of selling, uh, you know, you know, fruits, uh, very, very well-known fruits in in, in this uh, in this part of the world, in, in our part of the country, and uh, the story is still, I think, uh, known to all of us. So the connectivity, even if you go down to uh, beyond Bangladesh, I don't want to go into detail in that. There are good numbers of Afghanistan's living. My question is, in the last twenty years. Uh, the U.S. involvement has uh, brought about a lot of important changes. Uh, this did not find its way, and we have been hearing the reasons. Uh, but the question is, uh, I think uh, there had been a very sudden abandonment. They abandoned it without uh, taking into cognizance of what exactly they could have done. You know, it was just, I don't know whether to call it uh, a fatigue syndrome uh, within the government the previous government and the present U.S. government to, to say that enough is enough, our problem has been resolved, so we must move out. But then uh, uh, look at the people, the education, the new generation. Some of these generations, uh, which, which in the last 20 years, they study that you talked about uh, the, the women folk, they have gone into colleges, universities, they have spread all over the world. Now, we, you can't just uh, totally, when people have been trained, uh, people have seen the world, and they've got a lot of exposure, you can't just close your eyes and just say that uh, they, they should be left uh, on wilderness of whatever they are doing. The important thing is, I think, uh, there has been awakening, and you see, if the, the U.S. feels very shy to, to come up and talk, they want to talk through Doha. Well, that's okay. I'm sure they're making other other communication channels, which some of us are not aware of, but I'm sure uh, some of their experts who are in different parts of the world are also connected. As we have seen, if you go back into the history of Vietnam, the Vietnam is whole, the whole thing has been transformed because the, the Vietnamese who are abroad, they helped a lot in this particular area, even though, uh, you know, the Vietnam government by itself has been uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, I would say played a very catalytic role in this matter. 
Now coming back again, we see that all these people who are who are all over the world. We talk about the cricket team. We talk about a good number of such people in India, and uh, I'm seeing traveling all over the world in different universities. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, a good number of Afghan students also studying in Bangladesh in university. I don't know whether they could come and join their university. That's a million dollar question because we didn't come forward to help them out. There was some move, but uh, you know, I know that they, they, have, they have a lot of interest to come to Bangladesh. Uh, so you see, Bangladesh opened the doors and to invite them to come. Uh, we have, we have connected through SARC. Uh, I'm sure we all know that the, uh, Afghanistan is also a member of the SARC. So you see, it is part of our group. There's a, a Afghanistan, the embassy in, in, in Dhaka, though it's non-functional now. But it happens. But everything uh, can 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 come into operation, and I think the region has to play. If China is playing its own role, if Russia is playing its own role, and other countries are playing, and I think the region also has a lot of uh, interest in this area. And I think uh, this is the point I'm only trying to make over here. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. You did bring out a very interesting question about the youth linked to Afghanistan's takeover of by Taliban of the Bangladeshi youth. We have also carried out some youth surveys at BIPs, and we have come out with some disturbing results of what the intentions of aspiring militants in Bangladesh are. So our next question will go to Shafkat, Shafkat Munir from BIPs, who also heads our Bangladesh Center for Terrorism Research. Shafkat, you have the floor. First of all, uh, I want to, I'm a bit uh, in disagreement with Mr. Humayun Kubir Bhuya's point that Afghanistan is not a threat for Bangladesh. If we look at the genesis of violent extremism in Bangladesh, which happened in the 70s and 80s, there wouldn't be any violent extremism in Bangladesh if there was no Afghan Jihad. And I have been uh, working on violent extremism specifically related to Bangladesh for over a decade and a half now. And as President Bips has rightly said, BIPS has been doing extensive work looking at the implications of Afghanistan or what it means for Bangladesh. And many of our diplomatic colleagues here, we have shared our findings with them. And there are serious concerns for Bangladesh as we speak. It is a testament to our uh, CVE approach in Bangladesh that so far we haven't had any problems, but we have to be very careful that Afghanistan doesn't once again become a safe haven for international militant groups, which some of our panelists have also alluded to. My second point is this whole issue of culture. And I'm really glad that uh, Madam Aisha Kabir has raised this issue about women's empowerment and the treatment of women. I don't think we can necessarily hide behind the cloak of culture and say this is how Afghan women have been treated, so uh, it was a Western imposition. Afghan women during the Soviet occupation, or even before that, during King Zahir Shah's time, they had a very advanced society. If you read some of the essays that have come out about Afghanistan in the 60s, uh, it was way more advanced than many other countries in the South and Central Asian region. So to say that Afghan culture is where women are treated in this manner, I think is a bit erroneous. Also, we have had a lot of so-called intellectuals in Bangladesh commenting that uh, there is no way Bangladeshis can go to Afghanistan, particularly with relation to violent extremism. But our history shows that Bangladeshis have gone to Afghanistan even before Bangladesh became independent. Even during British India, people have gone to Afghanistan. So that's a reality. So we, we should be observing the situation in Afghanistan very closely because I would again argue it has significant national security ramifications for us. But since I have the mic, I want to take the opportunity to ask a question, particularly to Mr. Parvez Karim Abbasi. Uh, what about the role of Russia? Because I don't think that has been explicated enough in the comments here. Because uh, we see Russia making a comeback in Afghanistan. So what implications will it have for Russia? And especially Afghan uh, Taliban's comments about the Chechen rebels. Is that a reason for Afga Russia to worry or not? Thank you. Thank you, Chef Kata. Our next question uh, is from Brigadier Gyas, who is also former Bangladesh ambassador to many countries. So you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I lived around the uh, Afghan border in Pakistan as a soldier of the military officer. So I have seen their lifestyle and all quite a bit. Here I am trying to go back to past. Afghanistan has been a country 
always remain independent. Many, many big countries try to occupy them, rule them, they failed. You know that very well. Today we are discussing Taliban, Taliban, Taliban. Afghanistan becoming Taliban, we should sort them out. That sort of attitude everybody is having now. But these people could be a good people. They're very honest people, straightforward, what I've seen being there. I, I've been commanding the Pathan soldiers, a, a, a group of these Afghans, the excellent people, easy to command, easy to make them understand. Now, if we just keep on harping, even America, like Americans or some other countries that treat them harsh and they will be coming to the line. They are not the monkeys. You should think, how can we bring them to the main stream of life? We have rich people around, superpowers are there. They don't think of that way. They are now starving. I've been to their areas. If you see, you not believe how they live. They don't have a house. In the winter, they just, the way they live, you'll cry by seeing them in the border. I've been going inside, saw them. It's a sort of tribal society, basically. And they, even today, they rule the people through Ziga. You, I don't know how many of you know Ziga. And Ziga are the one head, and they are asked to, what happens in Pakistan, many people do murder and all, that. they go to that site. And what they, they hide somewhere. So Zirga, they're their tribal head. Through them, they, you know, rule them. They tell them, take this boy out, he has murdered and all. But they're not a complicated people. The way we are talking, why Taliban? First of all, you must know, they're very religious by nature. I'll tell you when I went to the battalion, these Pathans, first thing I was told, never tell this people, a shameless fellow. He will either kill you or he will commit suicide. So much of self-respect they carry with them. So we, we all the time, Taliban, Taliban, don't think. Even today, see the statement of present leader. He said, I am going to change. And we have been putting one thing all the time. You are a bad man. You are Taliban. You are going to. It's not right. I don't know how many of you have traveled through the land. If you go travel through that territory, you see a man just grazing his sheep or whatever it is, animal, but he has got a rifle at his back. Everyone carries a rifle. That is their aim to have a rifle. He doesn't have anything in his body, maybe a small shirt or something, but he carries a rifle. That's his symbol of his pride. So you have to understand them. I don't think people have understood. Buddhists went there from 19th, 19th century to 2000th century to 21st century, they all failed. If you go through that, how many places they have been bushed and bushed and killed? Many of these people have been killed during that period because British tried to rule them, they failed. But later on, all great superpowers went. We must try to understand them first. That's my, that's, uh, that's my attitude, that's how I thought of. And if you start all the time, a Taliban, 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 they'll become more Taliban. So we have to take it off from the head, especially superpower. Now they, somebody says, blast them, finish them. You can't finish them. So I like this. So this should not be our attitude towards Taliban. And we should try to get closer to these people. Their government now, I think he's more, uh, the, the present leader, his today's statement, yesterday's statement, he's very favorable. He's saying, I'm going to let women work. Women educate. A group is always there. In our country, we are mullahs, you know, but don't start thinking that they fail. So my suggestion is that don't start talking about only Taliban, but get them to your fold. Let Pakistan, India, all these countries, Muslim countries, they are a bit too much religious by nature. So you should respect their way. But Taliban is what? They want to do Muslim, Islamic culture or something, Islamic government. So we, have, we avoid that. But get them nearer. All these countries, all the countries around them, they should be used, they should be used by superpower to get them into our fold. So that's our, my suggestions. We should 
shake off our attitude towards them and that we may do better to the Taliban and to the region itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our next question is from Mariam, Egyptian Embassy. Um, thank you, General uh, We have discussed um, almost um, all the sides of the Afghani uh, case here, but uh, we did not discuss what can be the regional response when it comes to the organizations of the region to deal with the, um, the, the how can I say it, the, the security threats that um, that uh, the cable, the cable situation might impose in the moment, uh, especially that um, that Bangladesh is member in the Beamstack and in the SARC. So, what will be the initiatives in the future so that we can deal with the security situation in Afghanistan? I can see that uh, there is a <clears throat> there is a confusion when we come to see the Afghan situation currently. Uh, because we are used that if there is a foreign power pulling out of a country, usually they give them finances, they intervene in the restructuring of the country. So uh, that burden is now left for the regional powers. So uh, besides from the uh, the the the, uh, exp ex the 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 talks happening between. Uh, the trio uh, between uh, Pakistan, China, and uh, Russia, and the uh, rest of the group. Uh, what are the vision of the region? How? Wh what is the reaction? What is the steps? The next steps to deal with Afghanistan and prevent the repercussions on the other countries. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Abu Rushd from Bangladesh Defense Channel. I'm the editor in chief. We, as a Muslim, we are very fed up listening this few times, Islamic terrorism, these Taliban's, these terrors, this, we are calling this Mujahideen's, these terrorists. From 1979 onwards, we have been listening to this. We are fed up with this because as a Muslim, I feel ashamed. When a Christian commits a crime, you don't blame Christianity. Look at that lady, he's putting on his up. My daughter is sitting there. She's not putting on his up. She's putting on a Western attire. Before 1971, 1979, when Soviet Union they went for this Afghanistan, before then that, there was no such terms in the world. Islamic terrorist, Islamic terrorism, jihadist. After that, it came up. President Reagan invited the Mujahideens at White House, and he discussed the, so the Saudi uh, but, uh, the king, he declared jihad and from Bangladesh alone, so far I can recollect, I was in army that time. There was a question during my promotion exam in 1987 about this Afghan, uh, how many Mujahideens went there and this and that and so forth. 10,000 Bangladeshis went and fought there. Many of them died there, nearly 3,000. And many people from all around the world, from the Muslim countries that went there, why the world, they asked them to destroy the Soviet Union and they initiated the so-called jihad. As a Muslim, jihad is a term like crusade. I just, nobody, I just don't give this, uh, this, uh, this privilege to denounce my religious words or my religion. Look at Pakistan. I had visited many a times that uh, country. I have went to the Turkham border, Khyber Pass. I saw the lives of the Pashtuns. I found there more than 3 million Afghans living there from 1979. After the withdrawal of the Soviet Union from, 90, uh, from uh, Afghanistan in 1989, nobody just bothered. Now look at Pakistan. They had a vibrant society, vibrant culture. I, uh, in Lahore, in Islamabad, the lives were different. In Karachi, all were gone. Why? Due to this. Why did you go there? The, uh, the Soviets, the Americans, why did you go there? Leave them alone. Okay, now, again, you have left them alone. But the question is that, please engage them. Once you engage someone, then you can talk to him. You can talk to them. You can uh, make something uh, out of it but leave, leave these Pashtuns or leave these Afghans or Tajiks or whatever it might be. Leave them alone. Leave them live their life. If they want to put on burqa, let them put on burqa. 
If they want to leave, uh, put on the Western hijab, Western attire, it is their decision. Our uh, famous Bengali, uh, the, this uh, writer, said Mustawali, when he was a professor in our, at our Kabul University in 19, back in 1929, that time the Bachai Sakao, a dacuit, he invaded this Kabul because uh, the, the king, uh, Amanullah, he wanted to westernize the society abruptly. It had a, it had a reverse reaction. Uh, you must understand it. So look at Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a predominantly Muslim country. If you just tell some lady to put on bikini and just uh, highlight it, and that then and you just mean it that this is the uh, woman liberty, then it's not going to work. However, I am not, uh, I'm just cutting okay. short. I personally, I am yes. fed up and I don't want to listen to this words, Islamic terrorist, jihadist, so far. Solve this problem. You created this problem. Now, before 1979, there was no such word. From Afghanistan, it came. Now, there is a word I am telling, uh, just uh, letting you know, that is Talibanism has come. What that guy has said, a young guy, I have also uh, just was, when I saw it in the social media, I got astonished. So many young people, they are so jubilant. They, they just wrote in the social media, we won on 15 August. Why? They are just like my son, 23, 24 years old. Because they are aggrieved. Please don't make the people aggrieved more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rush. Thank you. We will take one last question. And then we'll go back to the panel for their response and answers. Uh, the last question is Dr. Nazia Manzur here. Um, hi, my name is Nazia Manzur. I teach at North South University. I teach English literature, which might make you wonder why I'm interested in a topic such as this. I research on uh, the areas of postcolonial theory, and I'm also interested in political theory and the implications of, of violent political impositions, and what happens as an intersection of memory and trauma in a moment of violent political upheaval, which is primarily why I'm interested in today's talk. So I wanted to briefly comment on several things that's been brought up, uh, particularly about the role of women, which we seem to be very interested to discuss ad nauseum. Pretty much every discussion on anything begins and ends somehow in South Asia with women's clothes. So perhaps uh, this might be something we might want to take stock on, why we begin a conversation about Afghanistan with women's empowerment and why we want to end a conversation on women's empowerment, whether without taking into account the role of uh, international foreign policy foreign policy that is now geared towards feminist foreign policy, which never used to be a thing before 9-11. Because suddenly, immediately after 9-11, when the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan was becoming a reality, probably the first time in modern contemporary political history did we think, or did we see instances where feminism was trotted out as one of the reasons why an invasion of a certain sovereign nation might be warranted or justified. If you remember Laura Bush's advocacy that we must save our sisters in arms, or our sisters in cover. Or if you remember the Guardian writing articles saying that, uh, why are women so wholly absent from the narrative of terrorism and trauma? We must reinsert the women into the narrative. In other words, we must rescue the women from the clutches of the Taliban, which is very similar to um, turn of century colonial narratives that we have seen previously in Algeria and also in India, where statements such as white men saving brown women from the clutches of brown men would justify the colonial mission. So when we talk about the role of women in Afghanistan, we must really put the conversation in the context of how women always and women's bodies always have been a part of warmongering missions and how it's a participant, how it's a, a factor that would help us understand the status quo, that would help us monitor the ways in which women's lives in Afghanistan have been controlled, surveilled, and managed. So I think before we say overgeneralized commentary such as this is how women's lives have always been in Afghanistan, or this is about Islam, or this is about the misrepresentation of Islam, we must really put our discourse into perspective. And one final note about um, youth engagement. I completely agree with Shubham because I remember distinctly on 15th August, we were reading A Handmaid's Tale in my class and just the day before when we were having this discussion in the classroom, that's by Margaret Atwood, if you're, if you're unfamiliar, just the day before the discourse was about, oh, it's a dystopian world. It's a little you know, far-fetched. 
the day after 15th August when we met for class, the discourse was, wow, this is real, because this impacts us, this impacts people like us. And so many people on social media were joyous and celebratory of Taliban's win. I have students who lamented and spoken out in distress of seeing their comrades, friends, um, speak out in tones in support of Taliban, in support of Taliban takeover. So it's a real, um, real world dynamic that we must take into account before we pontificate and theorize as though we're not talking about real people on the grounds. So thank you. Thank you. We have come to the end, but I can still accommodate you for one last comment or question. I'm from Islamic University of Technology, which is a subsidiary organ of OIC. Uh, so our university campus is in um, Ghazipur. Before this, I used to spend a lot of time in Mall United Nations. That's how me and Shubham, we got to get connected. Uh, the problem that I've seen, uh, you know, in our youth engagement regarding problem solving this issue was that the issue of conformity. Uh, we always try to put in our own notion upon people. Like, uh, after I have been to a series of time in my university in IUT, uh, I've got to engage with a lot of Afghanistani people. Like. And our university, we have around 22 people, uh, 22 nation uh, people coming here, starting from Yemen, uh, Palestine, sorry, Palestine, Afghanistan, and Pakistan also. So over here, when we engage with them, we get to see that, you know, the issue of like us being not being able to understand them, like we, as some of the panelists have said, uh, we are not engaging with them. You know, like not everyone is bad. Uh, think about the people over here in this room. You cannot quote every person being a bad person. You need to understand what his morality is, what his sense of basic understanding is. That's how you get to judge a people. So what we feel was that, uh, like I personally feel is that we should be looking for more decentralized systems. Like I understand globalization is good. You know, it's helping to reach out to people, giving them, uh, you know, a think of a proper standard. But you need to understand, you know, not every standard is equal in each cases. Like I'm an engineering student. Uh, you need to understand that uh, what we understand is that you know standards vary from places to places. Uh, you can basically put on the same standard everywhere. And one uh, particular issue that I would like to uh, like put up was that you know Chinese uh, and the Chinese debt trap. We all know about it. Like you know they put tons of tons of money in particular location and they end up taking over their land, their infrastructure, and etc. So can there be ways where how we can address them to make sure another sort of a, like a takeover by the Chinese government over the Taliban? Uh, can be prevented because you know this sort of people they just want freedom we in Bangladesh uh, when in 1971 all we wanted was freedom we didn't give care about who was it how was it but we just wanted freedom so as with my engagement what I feel like uh, when people they just want freedom and uh, we should move towards a more decentralized system or decentralized world than just ushering globalization thank you so we will uh, start in the reverse order for your response and answers so three minutes each I'll be answering a few questions because, again, I'll be leaving it to the rest of the body, uh, the other two panelists. Three minutes are starting here. So I'll first answer the ubiquitous American who's more Bangladeshi than most of us, Dr. Forrest Cookson. So everyone's favorite American. He's quite right in terms of basically, number one, that, again, it is not feasible, economically feasible to extract more, much of the new resources on paper. At least you require seven to 10 years if the conditions are right to extract them. And only if the prices in the market go up. So that which is not feasible now might become feasible later, but that is for the future. And number two, of course, United States withdrawal from America might sound bad on paper, but if the American were, if I was an American policymaker, I'd be clapping myself because what have I done? I set up an explosive grenade and I've just tossed it in a region which I consider as hostile. Who's going to go down under? Central Asian republics, very close to Russia. China, all the better for this instability in Xinjiang. Pakistan, eh, there is a relationship, but even if they, they, again, they're very close to the Chinese. Iran, so again, Americans is a master stroke. If you, if you are cynical, you say it's a master stroke because it has read a greater conflagration in the region, number one. Number two, there was another question about, again, Russian involvement. So the Russian involvement with Taliban, Russia is a civilizational state, just like China or Iran or India. So it has its own unique way of dealing with this. Remember, the US invasion of Afghanistan would not have been successful if it did not, did not get cooperation from Iran and Russia. 
and not to mention also Pakistan. And in this case, uh, and in this case, through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, it is playing a role in engaging with the Taliban. But again, the Taliban themselves don't have complete monopoly of power. It is a centrifugal power. And again, there are many groups and subgroups over there. And what we forget is not a Pathan story all the time. There are Uzbeks who are supported by Uzbekistan. There are Tajiks who are supported by Tajikistan. And again, remember, there are more Tajiks in Afghanistan than in Tajikistan. There are more Tajiks in Russia too. Now, in this case, each of them will be working over there. And there was also a question over there. Russia has a base in Tajikistan of 6,000 soldiers. And in Tajikistan, one of the poorest countries in Central Asia, there is a problem of, again, extremist groups spilling over. So again, Russia would be playing a vital role in terms of providing security coverage if things go well, but it remains to be seen. Same, says, same to be said for Pakistan. The third issue, and I think I just have one more minute. We are always saying Afghan values. Wake up, people. There are nothing called Afghan values. There are Pathan values. Pathans identify themselves as Afghans. The others were Tajik, the others were Uzbeks, the others were Hazaras. And also, women's conception of culture, women's con conception of covering, the Hazaras have a different concept of covering themselves up. The Wahis in Badakhshan, Ismailis, the Nuristanis, the Aymaks, they have different conceptions. Even the Gilzai Pathans, they are different from the, they are the southern Pathans, the rural Pathans. Their values are different from the urban Pathans. So again, we cannot conflate everything. One size fits all. We are following the same Western stereotype. And last but not the least, again, whether a woman wears a bikini, a burkini, a abaya, it should be her own choice. And again, that, again, the case of Malala Yousafzai, we should not forget. And I do understand possession is nine tenth of the law, but we have also seen nobody rules in Kabul for long. And if Afghanistan unravels, it is bad news for the entire region. And just going back, and before handing over the mic, because nobody wants to give over the mic. One last thing. How does it impact Bangladesh? Go back to 1757. Why did Nawab Shirajudullah lose? Because he was worried about Ahmed Shabdali. Afghan was raiding in India. Muslims killed more Muslims in history than Christians or Jews or Hindus. And at that time, Nawab Shirajudullah was keeping more soldiers on the Bihar border, so he could not compete with Clive. Afghanistan has a way of affecting every country in the subcontinent and beyond. This reality, if we ignore, we do so at our own peril. Thank you. Thank you, Pervez. So, Lamifer, you have the floor for the next three minutes. Uh, let me stand as well, uh, following my other you know, uh, presenters. Um, okay, uh, actually, Parvez has made my uh, job uh, much easier, and also I thank you very much for pointing this out. Yes, uh, recently we have seen that, uh, you know, instead of, uh, in fact, uh, uh, white men saving brown women, the idea is that white uh, women are the saviors of white uh, uh, brown women, and uh, that is fundamentally problematic. It should be my choice, whatever kind of attire I'm going to wear, and uh, in terms of, you know, South Asian, I uh, idea of purta or veiling. Uh, remember in uh, 100 years back, the idea of veiling was practiced by rich Muslim and Hindu families because there were no, uh, they did not let their women to be, you know, um, uh, um, to be out in the open and to be a matter of uh, staring at by other, uh, you know, non-elite people. So the idea of veiling, uh, idea of purta, this has changed over time and in different culture. So why are we talking about universalization or creating a singularity in the name of you know um, uh, Afghan women wh what they will wear and that will determine whether they are civilized or not. So here there is a very uh, difficult question of who, uh, who is civilized, who is not civilized. Number two if you rem uh, I um, initially said that we are uh, seeing things from a very western perspective, even western perspective regarding Afghan women's veiling is changing. Read an article was published in the New Yorker on uh, September 6th and it's, it talks about other Afghan women and it talks about that uh, how uh, about
about uh, 80%, uh, 80 to 78 percent of the population, they live in the rural areas. And what do rural women say? They want to preserve their culture, and uh, they want to. They believe that under the Soviets, under the Americans, uh, they did not live uh, properly because their sons were missing, their husbands were missing, their neighbors were missing, and it is the women who were left out there to fend for themselves. This is something that they have been very much uh, suspicious of anyone coming from the outside trying to control their territory. So what are those women's perspectives? The New Yorker article, which is quite a big read for 10 to uh, 13 minutes, that clearly says that they are happy under Taliban. Remember, I'm not supporting Taliban in any, uh, under any condition. I'm just talking about the perspectives given there. Not only the New Yorker, but there are some other, uh, you know, um, I, I think the Atlantic also published something similar to uh, that line that what do these women want? And I was just, um, a tweet was there, um, I think uh, just uh, three days back, um, uh, which says that now majority of the Muslim MPs are in Greece and they are en route to uh, Canada, whereas while they were in Afghanistan, uh, remember, the parliamentarians are urban-based representatives and the Afghan parliament did not function most of the times. So what do these women do when they were parliamentarians? Their, uh, their tasks are very much questioned and uh, all of these things we need to take into account. So enough about women's issues because as a woman, I always have to answer this question. There were several other interesting questions. Uh, and one thing I'd like to add that Westphalian state model is something that has been imposed on Afghanistan. And even during the First World War, if you read the history, that uh, French people, they did not have any idea of the border. Only the, during the wars in different European countries, the idea of border came to people's mind, yes, this is what we have to defend. Uh, so the concept of nation state, although coined in 1648, it is very new to even many parts of South, South Asia. Uh, in, in the uh, bordering area of uh, South um, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, it's, it's often very, very convoluted. People living there, they do not know which part they are living in. Um, and then again, another question was about Bangladesh can Bangladesh Bangladesh play as a soft uh, power player in Afghanistan. I think it's too early for Bangladesh to venture uh, over there because Bangladesh has uh, Bangladesh has a very good record of working there um, through Black and uh, a couple of my friends, my colleagues, my students. They have also worked there. Uh, but now I think it is uh, we need to wait and see. And of course, I agree fully with Shafkat and um, uh, Parvez about uh, the rising threat of uh, violence, uh, um, uh, violent extremism. We are downplaying this. Believe it, believe it or not because there are digital extremists working in Central Asia who are, um, um, you know, um uh, alluring people through uh, different digital means and uh, you know um, I think uh, in September 2020 there was a rapid survey on joblessness of women um, by PPRC and BIGD and they coined a phrase which I, I love to quote feminization of joblessness this has happened in Bangladesh a number of women who have access to technology who and the female entrepreneurs how they have lost their jobs and who knows that they will not be recruited because uh, they receive a kind of agency. Uh, they feel a kind of empowered that, okay, I've been given money and now I'll, I have a gun. I know how to uh, carry out this kind of activities. So I have an agency. People will listen to me. Remember the very last so far, even during the pandemic, uh, uh, female suicide bombing took place, um, I think, in Philippines, August 23, 2020. So all of these things we need to take into account that women are equally capable of being violent and is, is is not in their nature to be peaceful all the time. Being, I, I know that. I know that very well. That not all men are violent. Not all women are peaceful. So we need to keep we remembering that. Um, okay, you are. Many of the men are going to go back home and tell their wives that now. But that was not my intention. But this from a very theoretical point of view, I'm saying that. So we need to always be mindful of how this feminization of joblessness can affect, um, you know, and give a rise to violent extremism in Bangladesh. Maybe it's happening. Maybe we do not have data. Maybe we do not have any surveillance. But then I must have to thank CTTC, which have uh, introduced a whole of society approach after a holy artisan incident. And we have been able to more or less track. But uh, even then, uh, there were initial reports of some Bangladeshis trying to go to um, Afghanistan via different channels. So we need to be mindful of that. Um, I think I'll stop here. Uh, uh, last comments from Jill Fedos. Next three minutes. I'll come straight to uh, my friend Ambassador Shamim's question. He has directly asked me that should YC play a role in helping if you organize uh, this state and 
should, is there a need for modernization of Taliban ways? The answer to both is simply yes. Not only YC, the entire world community, including the regional association, they should come in assistance for this particular state. And since Taliban may not be the ideal solution for Afghanistan, but for the time being, that's what we have. And we have to do with it. There is no other alternative. So all the neighbors, regional powers, and the big powers, they should appreciate this particular fact and try to help the Taliban government to settle down and start good governance over there. Now, regarding the modernization of Taliban. Modernization, yes, sir. Definitely, you need to mend your ways. I know the Taliban also appreciates this, uh, that whatever image they had during the 1996-2001 period, they have a major departure from there. But the only thing that they cannot demonstrate to the world, they have very clearly said that they are going to be more moderate in this time around, but no one believes it. No one is believing them, but they have to demonstrate. So at, this is the time that you need to have some strategic communication. Strategic communication with the foreign actors, with the people and the friends around, that yes, you have really changed your ways and you are not going to be as strict on the women issue and the suppression and all those things. Many things are self-imposed. I was watching an interview. Someone is saying that the girls are not coming to the work. They have asked why. Well, we don't feel like going. Why? Because they think that there may be a, a ta Taliban reprisal against them. But the Taliban said that we have not stopped doing this thing. But what they have done, that in the university, they have said for the time being, there will be separate separation of, for the girls and for the boys. There is no, in the co-education system, separation. And the other schools are yet to open. So those girls are still in confusion that what is going to happen to their future. So my suggestion, my humble advice that why not let them decide? Let the women decide what they want. You have to distinguish between urban Afghanistan and rural Afghanistan. Let the urban Afghanistan live its own way and leave the rural Afghanistan, you know, the 20,000 villages. Each village is a kingdom. And the village leader basically decides what happens there. So in order to modernize those village women, you need to engage those leaders and bring them to the fold in the modernization. And in the meantime, you have to send out messages to all the corners of the world that what you are planning to do. And you have to have a robust foreign policy. Rather than being aligned with one particular country, the Taliban should be more open in its foreign policy and inclusiveness, like Iran, the Central Asian countries, Pakistan, India, China, Russia, and, and other organization, major actors. You can get, reach out to them. Do not wait for them to come to you. You have to reach out to them. But now they have a very, very limited way they have started. The conference in Pakistan, right? Just a couple of days back, there was a conference in Doha with the EU, EU countries where you are asking for help. So you need to put your things together and uh, uh, my heart out goes out to this Afghan people. The dire situation they have been left behind. Like uh, Professor Basiwati has said that it was like a grand had been launched in the backyard and taking care of so many of its so-called enemies hmm? together. That may be true, may not be true, I'm not very sure. But Afghanistan in the middle of it. You have to sort out your problem, reach out and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the very rich discussion we have had this afternoon. It is not possible for either me or for Zafar to summarize because the discussion has been so rich and varied. But you will see much of the proceedings in the press. All I can say is that Afghanistan is a developing story. It is not possible to assess the complexities of Afghanistan situation within 100 days. We need to watch it very carefully because whatever happens there has a direct implication and bearing on South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and beyond. Fortunately or unfortunately, much of what is going to happen there will depend on some key actors, notably the actor that has departed, United States and his allies. A major actor is now from coming from Beijing, 
We have a direct role and play by Pakistan. Other actors who are trying and jockeying into their positions or repositioning themselves are the Indians and the Iranians and many of the Central Asian republics. So we have a whole scenario which is in a flux. The fluidity of the situation makes it difficult to assess from outside. But it is important for us in South Asia in particular to understand the complexities of the development. I also take note of Maryam's remarks about the role of the South Asian organizations, what kind of role they can play, or the regional organizations, what kind of role they can play. Certainly, Afghanistan should not be seen in the hyphenated relationship of India and Pakistan rivalry and conflict. That is not conducive either for the Afghans or for the South Asians. We need to see in a holistic manner because it has direct implications not only on the security of South Asia and beyond, as our speakers have very rightly pointed out, it has implications for your geoenergy. It has implications for its geoeconomics. It has social implications. It has violent extremism implications. So the question of Afghanistan is very large on the canvas, but it is complex. I would like to thank our panelists today that they were able to address many of these questions within the very short time that was given to them, but a richer response came from you, the audience. I thank you for that. This is a conversation that will continue. With that, I now hand it over back to my co-host, Zafar Soban from Dhaka Tribune. Uh, thank you, Jenny, there. Um, there's not a great deal to add here. What I would also like to reiterate my thanks to the panelists and to all of you who've taken the time to join us. I think this has been an extraordinarily rich discussion. And being the nature of the subject, of course, as has been mentioned by a number of people here, even with the richness of the discussion, there's much more to be discussed. And as uh, my co-host has mentioned, I think this is going to be an ongoing and continuing conversation. I think in an attempt to sum up, I could say that one consensus we may have reached uh, this afternoon is that whether the Taliban takeover has been uh, good or bad, uh, we all recognize the fact that at this particular juncture in time, we cannot abandon uh, the Afghanistani, the Afghan people um, to their own uh, devices. And if one is not moved by the uh, impending humanitarian crisis, which is about to unfold, if not has already unfolded, we certainly need to take into account the uh, potential for instability, which can actually um, extend from Afghanistan as an epicenter. And I think one of the things I'll say in closing is that we, have, we should understand that, you know, Afghanistan is, is not an island at all, okay? And it's very strange that such a remote, mountainous, landlocked region of the world should actually have such influence over um, geopolitical affairs. But I think as we move in in the 21st century, 2022 is just around the corner, we're moving into increasingly fractious and volatile in bellicose times. Um, we see various players on the international stage moving away from cooperation and towards a more confrontational stance. We see I wouldn't say sabers being rattled, but I think confrontation is the right word to use. And it seems that Afghanistan, because of its unique um, geographical location, is very much going to be caught up in this. So when we talk about Afghanistan, we cannot just talk about Afghanistan is in and of itself and Afghan people in and of themselves, but we actually have to look at it in the context of geopolitics. And I think in conclusion, I just want to reiterate what uh, Pervez said, which I thought was a marvelous coda to our conversation, where he said that uh, however complacent we might wish to get, Afghanistan has a way of impacting all of us, whether we know it or not, and whether we like it or not. So on that note, thank you very much. This has been a marvelous discussion. Uh, I want to thank BIPS, our co-hosts, uh, for being the animating, um, the animating uh, partner here. And 
I would um, um, invite all of you to continue this discussion outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zafar. Before we end, I will request all of you to join me in thanking our panelists today. And thank yourself.